Grab your favorite drink, whether it's a coffee, cocktail, or tea, and get ready. It's Ladies Night on Lady Overlander Radio. Hey, everybody. Good evening and welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Misty Tukarski, and this is my co-host, Arlo, with Bats Off Road. Say hi, Arlo. Hey. Hey, girl. Hey. Hey, girl. Hey. (laughs) We also have some special guests joining us tonight. Brittany from Hourless Life, Laura from Crayons and Cairns, and Mary from Monkeys on the Road. Welcome, ladies. Hey, what's up? (laughs) (laughs) Very, very happy to see you all, and uh, it's great to talk to you all again. We, uh, we chatted before I know. So um, first of all, I'd like to talk about Brittany. Brittany and her husband, Eric, and their son, Caspian, who's five, are currently in Mexico. And they are on their first part of their overland journey globally. So that's going to take you how long, Brittany? 10 to 15 years. Yeah. So mm-hmm. next time we see Brittany, there'll be a little bit more gray at the end of all that, I'm sure. <laughs> no, we will come back in between, but our vehicle will not. Oh, okay. And then we have Laura from Crayons and Cairns. And Laura is currently working on a documentary called The Mark We Make. And why don't you tell us a little bit about that, Laura? Yeah, that's right. So it is a documentary that is kind of just shedding some light on literally the mark that we make as we adventure, as we travel, as we overland. Specifically, this one is focusing on one of my favorite places in the whole world, in the middle of a slot canyon. I don't know if you know what a slot canyon is, but it's essentially a canyon that is deeper than it is wide. So it's this very, very narrow, narrow slot canyon. And they are basically like tabernacles of the earth, (laughs) in my opinion. They're They're beautiful. They're like sacred places. And lots and lots of people are, are seeing these places and they're becoming a little bit more mainstream. But then unfortunately, there's a lot of people who don't have a outdoor ethics taught, you know, under their belt. And so you see a lot of vandalism happening in these places. And so Mm. that is kind of what I'm focusing on. And it's also a little bit of my story. And me and my dad grew up, well, he he didn't grow up. He taught me. And (laughs) as I was growing up, we visited these places all the time. And so it was kind of like our bonding time together. So it's a little bit of that story and then just um, shedding light on that. So Awesome. I'm looking forward to the release for that. I yeah, can't wait. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and, then we, and then we have Mary Holland owner and she wrote the book. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> you can see how warm it is here in Utah. Oh yeah. I see that. It's, it's so cold here in Florida. I can't take it. So oh, there she goes. I think that was sarcasm, right? That was sarcasm. <laughs> A little bit. That was sarcasm. Little bit. <laughs> it got cold here last weekend. Yeah please. Hi. <laughs> and Mary wrote the book, Monkeys on the Road, and that book uh, outlined your travels from California to Argentina. So how long did it take you to do that trip, Mary? Um, we, I guess in total, it was almost four years. We, we left at the end of 2017, and we got to Argentina a few months, luckily or unluckily, before COVID began in uh, March of, of 2020. So then we were over a year stuck in Argentina. I've, I've got to stop saying stuck because it was a pretty good place to be stuck, all, all things considered. Um, and we stayed there. We waited for over a year. And then March 2021, um, we finally, long story, but had to leave the country because they wouldn't keep extending the visa for our vehicle. Mm. Um, and so we came back to the U.S. Um, yeah. So and here you months. are. Awesome. Like all of you guys are so hardcore and amazing. I just feel lucky to be with you guys. <laughs> oh, I feel the same way about you all as well. Absolutely. It's very nice to talk to everyone. So tonight's topic is overlanding with kids. And as you can see with Mary, she has a kiddo. Laura, how you have two daughters? I have three. Three. Three daughters. Mm-hmm. Brittany has a son that's traveling with her full time. Arla has a daughter. And then I have three kids, uh, two girls and a boy. Eric from Hourless Life says, we are enjoying reading your book, Mary. 
We've been reading it together in the evenings. It's a great book. It really is. <laughs> Hi, Eric. Hey, Eric. <laughs> he's back in the dark, back there in the Jeep. Oh, he's lurking? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's in a tent. Oh, okay. He's not literally, like, he's lurking. Just, like, <laughs> behind the bushes. Peeking behind the bushes know. at us. I want to know how to share the link with other people to tell them to, to dial in. Um, it is on the Lady Overlander Radio Facebook page. It's running there. It's also running on the YouTube page and on Arla's Mrs. Bats Off Road. Okay. So there's a couple places to grab it. Yeah. So overlanding with kids, that's kind of an interesting topic. And I selected it because I think from my experience, a lot of people are, are creeper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't make me laugh, Eric. It's not funny. No, just kidding. Um, a lot of people are wanting to get out and explore, and maybe they don't really know if they can do it with their children, or if their children really be into it, or if it's safe. You know, I've had people ask me, you know, aren't you worried about safety when you're out there and things like that? So, are we crazy for overlanding with kids? Absolutely. What do you think? No. <laughs> what do you think, Brittany? Are we crazy? I don't feel crazy, but <laughs> um, I mean, we didn't talk about this yet, but our family, we've been traveling full time since 2014. So February 21st is our eight year nomadiversary that we haven't had any home or property. So Caspian, our son, was born at the end of 2016, and he came from the hospital to our RV at the time, and he doesn't know anything other than full time travel. So for us, travel is our norm. It's where we feel at home. And um, we love it a lot. And Caspian just turned five. And I feel that travel has been so good for him. He's the most friendly and flexible human being that I know. And oh, I yes. aspire to be like him. He teaches me all the time. I, I love that kid. I love talking to him. He's so he's for a five year old child. He is such an interesting person to talk to. He is so mature for his age. And I love his nick his nickname, Little Nomad. That's so cute. And he really <laughs> has been a little nomad his whole life. That's that's amazing. Yeah. So, Mary, do you think that you you're, you said you guys when you started, your daughter was five, correct? So she uh, was Caspian's age. Yeah, I guess pretty much. We, we, uh, yeah. so we pulled her out of school and rented out our house. But when we actually crossed the border, she just had turned six. Oh, okay. And so how, you guys traveled for four years. Yep, about. She's now. Yep. And so she was from six to 10 years old. And how much of that trip does she still remember? I think she remembers all of the trip. More of the question is how much does she remember even before the trip? I think because there was quite a big change, you know, living in a house and then living in a van, she has memories. Whereas like, I don't think I could personally select a pre six years old memory from my mind because I lived in the same place for sort of the first 18 years of my life. Um, but yeah, I mean, she, she often will, st she'll still mention things now and then that happened on the trip. Something reminds her of it here or someone, we ask her about it or, hey, do you remember this? And yeah, I think, I think she remembers a lot of it. I bet Caspian even, he's, he's younger, but I bet he'll have so many memories because I think there's just so, so much change, right? Like, oh, that yeah. was the year I was in Mexico. That was the year I was in whatever state of the USA. That was the year we swam with the turtle, you know, whatever the thing was. I bet he'll remember a lot more than like I remember from my fifth year of life or fourth year of life. Yeah. Well, and I, yeah. I hear a lot of parents saying who have really young kids, oh, we're not going to go yet because they won't remember it. And to me, that's a little bit of a cop out, because even if we don't have the memories themselves, we have the lessons that the experience is yeah. teaching us. And those are foundational building blocks in our life, like learning how to be friends with people who speak a different language or look different from us or fill in the blank. Those are foundational things that we can build the rest of our life on. And so I always tell people, take your kids as soon as you can. I mean, they could be babies and you could still take them. They're learning so much, even as babies. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, mean, I think the only caveat to that, and I totally agree because I saw people with babies, but it's just that it's harder, right? So like Caspian's yeah. age now and Lily's age when we started, it's a much more manageable age because they're not wearing diapers. Like you can actually have a conversation and explain to them, like reason with them about things. So 
but but like you said i did see i have seen a lot of people overlanding well not a lot but multiple families overlanding with much smaller kids and it's definitely harder but i definitely don't think the reason not to do it is because they won't remember it because they will have those memories just like you say Brittany. um but i think the reason not to do it or to wait is just because it's easier on the parents <laughs> oh absolutely and we've been full-time for almost five years now so our kids are, my twins were seven and my younger daughter was five when we started. So they absolutely, they remember. And it's funny because sometimes the memories get a little mixed up, but like you guys said, you know, they definitely remember the lessons that they've learned on the road for sure. So, oh, Mary, you just lit up. <laughs> you just lit up. <laughs> so road, road schooling. Are you guys familiar with that term? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So we do road, road schooling. Um, we started in our RV. And so we that's basically when you homeschool your kids on the road. And we've been doing that for almost five years as well. And that's actually going really well. So what is your experience? Do any of you homeschool or do you, do your kids go to public school? How do you guys handle that? Who wants to go first? <laughs> Nobody. I know. I know. Caspian's a little young. I know you're starting to do some things with him, Brittany, but oh, not really pushing him. Well, we homeschooled then because Lily, she did kindergarten in America, in the USA, um, in California. And when we started on the trip, she would have been entering first grade. So yeah, we we fully 100% homeschooled, and we ended yeah. up homeschooling first. And so I remember when we were planning the trip, I researched first grade pretty thoroughly and picked programs and bought materials and blah blah blah, printed out like the California state requirements of what you're supposed to learn. And then I remember printing the second grade ones kind of like, almost like, oh, just slip a second grade in there just in case. And then like a few years later, I'm like, I got to print the fourth grade ones because I don't have those. <laughs> <laughs> but so now here we are, fifth grade, and she's going to the local school here in Utah, a public school, which is bilingual, which was kind of the biggest, oh, nice. the biggest parts of my search for where to live once we got kicked out of Argentina was I want her to not lose the Spanish that she got. And so he managed to find a, a good neighborhood with a bilingual school. Which is, which is so Mary, how is she adjusting to going back into public school? You know, I think it's, it's like Brittany was saying about Caspian, like when kids live like that, they're just, they're so used to things being different every day. It's funny, I've done a few kind of like interview podcast things and people always ask, what's the effect on Lily? And I say, it's really yeah. hard to say because first of all, I only have one kid and she only had the one life and I can't compare, right? But also, I mean, she's, she's very flexible. Maybe she would have been anyway, but I like to think that it's because of the trip and that she went to, I mean, she went to a bunch of different local schools because often we would stop, often, I mean, three three times we stopped um, and rented a house for a period of time, three months or a year in Argentina, um, and she went to a local school. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it's always difficult to start a new thing, but I, I like to think and hope that our kids are a bit better at it. That The first day of school, she was excited. It was a Monday, I guess. Second day to Tuesday, she was okay. And Wednesday, she cried a bit and did a little bit of a hugging, like, I don't want to go. And mm. the brilliant thing was mm. that the way they do their school is the first half of the day is all in Spanish with a Mexican teacher. Second half of the day is all in English with a teacher from Utah. And so it was luckily the morning. And the Mexican woman, with, which at that point, you know, she's 10, four of her 10 years, and really most of her years that she remembers, she's been surrounded by Latin American people and talked in Spanish to those people. So for her, she felt much more at ease and comfortable with that face and that voice and that language, honestly, at that point, at least from a teacher's perspective, not from our parents. And so the teacher against all COVID rules, everyone's wearing masks and six feet distance and whatever. But because she's Mexican, here's my stereotype. She walked over, hugged Lily, took her by the hand and said to her in Spanish, you're such a brave girl and you're so smart and walked her up into the classroom and closed the door. And I was like, if it had been the American teacher, I don't think that would have happened. Yes. <laughs> Probably not. No. That's amazing. Hey, Amy. Hey, Amy. Yeah. <laughs> so during our last conversation, Misty, we talked at length about kind of my philosophy of schooling Caspian on the road. And then since that conversation, which people can go back and listen to, I wrote an article on our blog called, how could you do this to your child? <laughs> and uh, it's all about my philosophy of parenting uh, that I share with Eric and of schooling. And so I really dig into what we believe and how we're executing it and how that impacts uh, Caspian during our travels. 
also, if anyone's curious, it's really in depth more than we can go into right now. So. No, it's an excellent. I'm go read it. It's I'm very good. The philosophies yeah. of Brittany. That sounds amazing. <laughs> right? I love Brittany's philosophies. They're awesome. I'm very philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> Are you more philosophical in Mexico or less? than the u.s uh i think more because i have a lot more room to breathe here yeah a little bit slower pace and more relaxed kind of atmosphere really cleared out a lot of the clutter there's so many things you can't take with you oh that's so it it makes a lot of space absolutely so (laughs) then since a few of you have traveled internationally i'll ask have you ever been fearful when you've been overlanding, whether you, whether in the U S or, you know, in another country, have you ever been fearful for your children's safety or worried about a situation when you're, when you've been overlanding Mary, do you have any? Yeah, definitely. I don't think you can travel for that long without something happening somewhere. And plus, you know, as parents, as mothers, we're at least, I am overly worried. I think when I traveled with John, my husband, before Lily was born, I was much more blase about just going anywhere and traveling and not really thinking about it. But, On this trip with Lily, I was researching the news in each country before we entered it and just trying to really stay abreast of what was going on. Um, But yeah, there's a few few instances spring to mind, like in Bolivia, for example, we just happened by sheer unluck, dumb luck, (laughs) bad luck, to enter the country right when they were having their election. And we were following Mm -hmm. that the days before, because we know, like I said, we were reading the news of each country. Um, But the results were showing that they were going to have to have a second round. The way they do it there is you have to get more than X percent. And if you don't, then there's a second round of election. Um, And so that's what they were saying was going to happen. So we we were hanging out in Lake Titicaca on the Peru side and waiting to find out. So when we heard that news, we said, all right, we're safe. The next round is going to be, it was like four weeks away. So we drove over the border, kind of a bit of a remote one in Lake Titicaca. So there was no reception for a couple of days. We camped on the lake and stuff. And then when we showed up in La Paz and our phones started working, there was the news that the president at the time, Eva Morales, was saying, nope, I won, it's over, we're not gonna pr- announce any more results, we're not gonna tell you any more numbers, like, it's done, I won. So the city just erupted in protests, people marching everywhere, um, cars couldn't drive in or out, you know, there was a question about supplies of things running out, and it was a bit scary, I mean, you know, for, more because I had Lily with me, I think when it's just adults, you worry less, partly, because you made the choice to go there, but Lily didn't make the choice to go there. She just came with us, right? Um, but, you know, we stayed with this incredible local family. I, again, like time and again, as I mentioned in my book or any, on the blog or whatever, a local family kind of takes you in and helps you out. And it happened to so many times. And that's the main message that I hope comes across in, in my book anyway. But so we, we stayed just outside of this family's house. They had kids the same age. The schools were all shut down. So our kids all played together. And they just kind of advised us through it. They, they would say okay, like, stay calm, but they've just announced they're going to shut off the water supply, so we're just going to fill up all the bottles that we have, and I'm like, the water supply? <laughs> oh, like, no, yeah. yeah. Buying food every single day from the stores and just, you know, making sure we had as much as we could have in, in case of who knows what. Then they announced that they were going to shut down the borders, and so it was just, like, incident after incident that was a bit tense, um, but we sort of, at the same time, felt relatively safe because we were in this sort of compound, and we were someone that we trusted that would advise us. And it came, it came to a point where he said, hey, things are going to get worse. They're going to start having roadblocks 24 hours a day instead of 12 hours a day. I think you should leave at like 5 a.m. tomorrow and just blaze out and get to Argentina or Chile. So he did this like early morning escape <laughs> and, and, and crossed out of the country. So, yeah, I mean, it was a, it's a bit fear inducing when you have a, a child with you because there's less there's just more of a responsibility. Right. There's more of a sense of responsibility. Yeah, and I can totally see that. I mean, especially when you enter a new country, you don't necessarily, you're not fully versed on the political climate or anything that may come up, you know, necessarily. So that, that can be a big concern. I think one of the biggest things about overlanding internationally, I'll be curious, Brittany, as you're spending more time out of the country, how you feel about this too. It's the lack of a, of a network, right? Like something happens, like when we were in Argentina and COVID struck, it's a little unsettling to not, like, sure, everyone's really nice and people really try to help and but you don't have like that friend you've known for 30 years to, to call to help out or your parents or just even just to understand how do things work here? Like, you know, when Bolivia says they're going to turn off the water supply, like, is that real? Can they do that? Oh, it is. OK. Like, and it's just things are just difficult when you're in a different country because you're just not familiar with how things run there. Yeah, that's very true. Brittany, yeah, do you have part- 
part of our planning strategy for this drive around the world is to have local contacts in every single country that we go to because we've just learned the value of having that. And we're really fortunate here in Mexico to have so many family members on Eric's side, as well as overlanding friends that we've made during past trips. This is our third time overlanding through Mexico. And uh, it's so invaluable. And Eric and I talk about this a lot. There's just this unfamiliarity where you just don't know anything. You don't know how things work. And that's where so much fear and anxiety can come in. Because if we're in the United States, there's so many different areas and neighborhoods that we know in our gut that we are not going there after dark. And anyone who would ask us, we would tell them. And just by knowing, it gives us so much confidence. But the minute that you're outside of your country, you don't have that confidence anymore, but the locals do. So the very same gut feelings that we have in the U.S., they have in their own country. And so that's just something that we've learned and that has really helped us. Most of my fear happened before we came to Mexico the first time. So Caspian was one about to turn two. And it was just all the news articles and all the well-meaning friends. And, you know, I would just stay up at night wondering, am I being selfish? Because I really want to take this trip. But am I being selfish to go with my son? And what we learned to do from more experienced overlanders was only listen to the people who had actually made the trip. And so every time we would get a negative comment on social media, our response became, thanks for your input. How many times have you been to Mexico? Mm -hmm. And (laughs) normally we would never hear back from them ever again. And (laughs) so, yeah. And so that told us they had no idea what they were talking about and we didn't need to listen to them. So that's kind of how we handle that. And we've never had anything, any situation where we were in danger or even felt that we were in danger during our time in Mexico. I'm sure something will happen down the road and we will handle that as it comes. Absolutely. And as Mary stated before, and as my husband Joe put on here, it gives you mobility. You can avoid, avoid, you know, tangle entanglements and issues you know, that's one of the great things about having your vehicle and being able to move somewhere else. If there is an issue, making those network connections with others, like you said, and a great way to do that is through children. As Mary has learned, I remember you telling me that your uh, daughter ended up in somebody else's house and that's how you met that child's parents and it kind of just evolved from there. But, you know, being mobile, having that good network and, remaining flexible, I think are, are key things, especially if you're traveling with children. So definitely. So Laura, you said you have three daughters, correct? Yes. (laughs) So their, their age ranges, are they very close together or are they kind of spread apart? They're all two years apart from each other. Okay. So my youngest, which is crazy to say this, but my youngest is almost six. I don't know how that happened, but she's almost six. (laughs) My oldest is almost 10. So we're like getting into that sweet spot where like Mm -hmm. they are very independent now, which is awesome. awesome. Do you find that each one of them has a different take on overlanding or traveling or exploring or camping? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, they're like, they're individual people. They're doing their individual thing. And actually it's cool to see them bloom a little bit more because now I feel like especially my 10 year old is getting to that space where they're no longer, their, their world is no longer like just mom and dad and like family, you know, they're trying to find who they are outside of that space. And so I think that traveling and like everything that you guys have said, I could just echo that just it shapes them and it makes them into who they are. And I just think it's like the most beneficial thing for them. So Denali is like my, she's my worry wart. So she does stay a little bit close to me. She's my oldest. And then Juniper is just all about the rocks and like the trees and the collecting things. She's the six year old, right? So she's like, mom, look at this cool leaf or look at this cool rock, or, you know, constantly has pocket fulls of rocks. And Sage, my middle child, she is all about like jumping off the rocks and like pushing herself 
physically and learning those things, which I think just really core goes along with like, you know, just regular development of a child, like that phase that they're in and, and exploring the world. But yeah. So you have a rock collector and an adventure kid and then the, the one that likes to stick close to mom. Yeah. She's, she yeah. is my, well, she wants to get into videography actually. So, mm -hmm. which is kind of fun because that's my mm -hmm. thing. <laughs> and so she asked for a, a camera for Christmas. And so I ended up getting her a GoPro because it essentially is like undestructible, <laughs> you yeah. know, like she can take it underwater. She could drop it off a cliff and it would still be fine. And it also has like such a amazing built-in steady cam. So like she can be bouncing all around and it does a really, really got a really good job at like having great footage. So I think I haven't really, you know, tested it out, but I think that <laughs> the, um, the GoPro is going to be like a really good starter camera for her. So she actually taught her how to use iMovie. And so she like has been capturing stuff and editing her own videos and everything. So, and so it's super fun. Yes. I always find rocks. <laughs> rocks in the Same here. Yeah. Same here. That's my husband. And that's what he's saying. Cause we do find the same thing. Yes. Oh, yeah. Like why? <laughs> Yeah, we used to. They're mine are a little older now, and they don't have as many rocks and sticks yeah. and bugs, you know, in pockets anymore. But uh, the um, the big thing that my kids, I think, have gained from this is self confidence. They're much better at communicating with people they they don't know. Um, especially my son, as some of you know, he's on the autism spectrum. But if you met him, he's you know he's had the nickname the nickname the mayor at many places because he doesn't meet any strangers and he's willing and he's actually better at speaking to people than I am. So yeah. uh, he's, he's blossomed under this lifestyle. They really, they really all have, but you know, like you said, Laura, they're all different. They're all unique. Some of them love it. Some of them are like, Oh, I could take it or leave it, you know, but, and yeah. we, and we are attuned to that and we kind of go with the flow and, you know, Sometimes we stay put in a while, you know, in a place for a while. And sometimes we move around a, a lot. And I think, you know, flexibility is a big thing with that. So, yeah, I my husband, so. our son loves rocks. The rule is if you keep a rock, you have to give up a rock. Yep. That is a really good rule. Cool. I'm going to have to. Yeah. <laughs> we had a okay. about stuffed animals as well, because Lily was allowed to bring, I think it was five stuffed animals. She so carefully picked out the five. But then invariably people would give her things along the way. And so we would try to say, you know, one, just because of space and two, hey, did you see that that child that doesn't have much just gave you something like that's pretty amazing. How do you how would you feel about giving something not necessarily to that same child, but to some other child you come across? And so we tried to have that rule. And it's been just astounding since we got back. We've been back in the U.S. doesn't feel like very long. I mean, the number of toys she has, like it just they like grow without me even knowing what's, what's happening overnight. Like. I mean, yes, there was Christmas and then actually, yeah, there was her birthday and Christmas since we got back. So you have so many friends and relatives who say, wait, you have a mailing address for the first time in four years? <laughs> yeah. But so, yeah, now she has a lot of stuff, a lot of toys. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think I think there's a law that if you have a space, you fill the space. Exactly. Yes. Right. But and, and so I know that traveling with kids Thank you, Eric. Um, I know that traveling with kids full time, and I'm, I'm sure you can attest to this, Brittany, you don't have a ton of space for all the toys and all the things. And then you multi multiply that by three because I have three kids and they want to bring this and they want to have that. And we've had to make that rule not only with rocks, but with everything. If you get a new toy or you get something new, you need to donate that other toy or give that gently used toy away to somebody else because there's just not a lot of room. And we travel with two vehicles. But, you know, we're still very limited on space. And I know Arla has seen how loaded down we are. Yes. And every time we stop for a bit, you know, we streamline and we clear things out and reorganize. And it's a constant process, especially with kids, because you want them to have that, you know, connection to a few things, but you don't want their whole world to be things. Right. right. That's the whole idea behind doing this is more experiences and less things. Yeah. Well, and I think so. that that's one of the biggest thing that overlanding and just like the community and the the vibe of overlanding offers is uh especially for our kids is breaking that norm 
of not mm-hmm. just things, but like, I feel like it breaks a lot of norms. You know, you talk to people and they're like, wait, you do what? You know, mm-hmm. and it just really stretches the box. And so I, I hope, mm-hmm. and I don't know if this is, you know, how it's going to be, but I hope that what it did for my kids is just gives them like a very broad and big perspective of the world. You know, when you go and you interact with lots of different people or you get in situations where you have to problem solve and things like that, that, that most, most Americans won't experience. I hope that that's what overlanding the benefits of overlanding for the kids are for sure. Right. Absolutely. Kara asks, what is the plan for when your kids grow up? Will you visit them or continue the lifestyle or stop? Uh, Brittany, what what would you say to that? (laughs) I think that Eric and I are going to travel full time until we drop because I, I, neither of us can imagine stopping at this point. And we felt that way ever since we started traveling full time in 2014. Sometimes we feel like we need to slow down a little bit and stay in one place for a little bit longer. But within about a week or two weeks, we're antsy to get on the road again. So obviously we will visit Cassian and I have four older children through marriage too. So we're always thinking about visiting them and working all the family into our travels but that doesn't mean that we have to have a physical home base and in fact we've learned that being nomadic makes it a lot easier to make it to family events that normally we wouldn't be able to make it to oh i agree with that yeah i think that with my kids i mean my son always talks about he wants to get a van and travel around with us and he said you know mom and dad i'll park over here so you guys can have your privacy but you know i want to I want to travel with you and Aww. he's really getting into fishing now. And so he's, he's a definitely an outdoor kid. Um, I think he might actually travel full time when he grows up and my girls, mm-hmm. I think they'll probably, maybe they'll surprise me, but I think they'll probably settle down somewhere. So if we settle down, we, you know, we'll still travel around to see them and, and all that. But I don't know, Joe and I are having the same issue where, you know, sometimes it's nice to be a place for a while. And then when you're there for a while, you kind of, you're, you get a little stir crazy and, you know, you want to move on and see something new. And the other issue, and, and that might be because we were both active duty in the military, you know, we're used to moving around because no place ever really feels like home, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Mm-hmm. So every, every place that we go, we're like, wow, this is a really cool place, you know? Mm-hmm. So maybe it's a little bit of fear of missing out. Maybe it's just, you know, we're not ready to settle down permanently somewhere, you know, but I think if we keep our options open and remain flexible, the our path will find its way to us and take us down that road. So, Okay, so I have to ask you guys a question. Do you guys, have you taken the Enneagram test? The personality <laughs> test? Yeah. You yeah. guys don't know what Enneagram is? <laughs> it's no. been a long time. I don't remember what mine is. I've yeah. taken it before. I'm just so blown right now. <laughs> And I guess I'm just in the Enneagram space, but it is a really, really fantastic personality test that like when I read it, I felt like nobody had ever described me so well on paper, you know? And so I was curious what your Enneagram is because I'm like, I wonder if everyone here is a seven, which is me. And there are people who really like thrive on change and who thrive on adventure. And there's some um, people that I follow who, who do like Enneagram on Instagram. And they were like, this is the Enneagram's, you know, like number one, Enneagram's perfect house or whatever, or ideal home. And they got to number seven and it was totally a sprinter van. It was their mm-hmm. ideal home. And I'm like, so I'm curious if all of you guys are seven. So you'll have to go and take one of the free tests. <laughs> And get back to me and tell me what you are. Well, definitely. (laughs) Kara says not a seven. (laughs) What are you, Kara? Tell us. (laughs) Kara, tell us. Yeah, Kara, tell us. (laughs) Kara's furiously typing. I'm curious what it is. Like, if you guys aren't, you know, let's say we're not all sevens, which we're probably not. But what do you think is, like, that driving factor for those who just, like, thrive on on full-time travel 
you know, what do you like personally, just, I'm just throwing this out there. Sorry, guys. Can I ask a question? (laughs) I don't mean to take over the question. Oh, absolutely. I'm just genuinely curious. Like, what do you think it is that like each of us and the Overland community has that like drives us to do that? If it's not like, oh, you fit a perfect personality type, what is it? You know, it'd be interesting to see if we have similar, you know, upbringings regardless of what country we grew up in right but if we have similar upbringing similar parents something like that but but yeah i've always said i thrive on change the exact words that i heard you say a minute ago and so many people say people fear change that's just a state of just just a fact like that's just how people are they fear change and i'm always like "Mm, no no i'm so much happier with change i mean we've been in this rental house in utah for like what five months four months and i'm more like okay so what about if next year we got bicycles and (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My husband too also loves adventure and is a great partner. He also loves building things and he wants to build a workshop. And he's like, when am I gonna get to build my workshop? You know? Oh like, my gosh, our husband should get together. We should get together. I don't know if you know this, but my husband built our teardrop trailer. Nice. And he was like a builder and he he wants a workshop too. So we'll just get them together and then we can get together and they'll That's thrive and we'll it. thrive. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I said, can you have a workshop that can be in a trailer that we drag behind our van or <laughs> if you get a new tool, you gotta give away a new t- an old tool. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta stick with the rule. Oh, exactly. So Kara asks, do you miss the community of friends as you travel around? Yes. The in-depth relationships and the face-to-face interactions. What do you guys think? Arla? Yeah, I think I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> no. Arlo, what do you think? Have, you don't, I mean, you take everybody with you, right? Yeah, we <laughs> basically do. I mean, like ours is just weekend trips here and there and then some, you know, one week or here and there. Um, but we usually do hang out with the same group pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find that you don't hang out with other people that aren't into overlanding as much? Um, probably, yeah. Unfortunately, probably so. I don't think there's anything unfortunate about that. Like you find your people and yeah, we've, we've made amazing friends and family basically, you know, in this community. So, I mean, I, I mean, I love it. Yeah. I think it's the difference between the, like when you're weekending, which is what we're now going back to. I feel like, like Brittany and me, we probably, Brittany and I, probably have different experiences than the other two with weekenders. Cause that's the hardest thing about changing constantly is that you can't like, you can make a, a really, you can meet a really cool person, make a friendship, stay for a few days, a few weeks, maybe even a few months. But then if you always move on, like you're always starting from scratch, meeting new people and meeting new people, which is what I love about it. Mm-hmm. But yeah. definitely, like, in, in fact, I think I even write this in the book a couple of times. Like the one thing that I actually miss is the in-depth relationships, the friends that you've had for a really long time, with the yeah. shared history, all these local people who've been so generous and welcomed me in and treated me like family. Like I've sat at their you know, kitchen table and had a coffee over breakfast and they've sung songs and told me their life stories. And I feel like I could rely on them to help me, but you know, I've known them for two days. <laughs> it, it's different. So it'll be right. curious, interesting to see now that we're stable and we're starting to do more of the weekend thing, um, how, how we start to feel differently about making new friends in Utah that we can actually maintain for a few years rather than having to constantly meet new people. Well, I mean, you also meet new people and it's like you've known them forever. You just click automatically. Yeah. And you just Absolutely. become very close with them very fast and just feels like you've known them forever. So that, that's yeah, awesome. when you meet other overlanders. That was, yeah. I feel like we met so many local people but that was just definitely the highlight of my, of my trip was meeting all mm-hmm. the local people and having kind of, in-depth conversations about their lives and learning about just such an incredibly different upbringing to what I experienced. Um, but then also when you meet the other overlanders, just like you said, Arla, you kind of have this immediate bond because there aren't many people that you can have a conversation with about like, oh, I drove through 15 countries. Even when you get back to your friends in the US, John and I talked about sometimes you're hanging out with your friends in the US and you're like, oh, I wanna be able to compare this to so many things I've experienced, but it almost start to feel like I'm being repetitive or bragging or something. When you hang out with other overlanders, it's so much fun to compare like the border crossing or the time the police stopped me or this one town that everyone knows because it's the, you know, the most popular campground in Guatemala or whatever. So it's fun to have that shared history with some people. 
even when you've just met them that day. Yeah. What do you think, Brittany? You've, you've been the nomad longer than all of us. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, eight years on the road, we've gotten really good at learning how to sustain friendships long distance. And it's something that we put work into. And sometimes the other people do or can and sometimes they don't. I mean, it's hard when you're you have a life and it's going on right around you. You're not always thinking about the people that are thousands of miles away. And we totally get that. But uh, definitely community is the big thing that we miss, just having the same people around who you're living life with and even going through conflict with um, to get closer to one another. We don't go through conflict with a lot of friends because, you know, we're just not there all the time. But uh, it is a sacrifice. It's something that you sacrifice. But there are ways to cope with it and deal with it. And for us, that's being super intentional about the long distance relationships and the visits whenever we can. Oh, absolutely. And I know that one of the things that I tell my kids is, you know, I, st I was in the same elementary, middle school and high school with the same small group of children all throughout. And honestly, and if a few of you are watching, hi, um, but I only talked to very few of those people that I went to elementary, middle school and high school with. And that's not because I don't like them. It's because, you know, as I became an, an adult and joined the military and moved around, you know, you kind of lose touch. But, you know, as kids traveling full time, I feel like the relationships and the bonds that they make with the other kids that they meet are stronger I would argue than if they sat in a classroom with those kids every single day, because mm -hmm. they're on, you know, my kids all have their own electronic devices now, which, you know, is a, a taboo topic sometimes, but they're able to keep in touch with other kids that they meet. They're mm -hmm. able to build those relationships and chat on the phone and do video, you know, chats when we have signal and, you know, so do they get to go and go over to somebody's house and have a sleepover or play with blocks or, you know, race cars or whatever. No, not all the time, but sometimes they do. And sometimes, you know, they have, I feel like they have stronger relationships with some kids than if they saw them every day. I don't know. That's just my, my yeah. opinion. I was going to say that like, so I don't travel full time, but so from the other side of the, the pond, <laughs> I don't know why I said that. Cause that's the other pond. <laughs> um, <laughs> Isn't from that Mom, England? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so from England. <laughs> no, so um, like I, I've lived in Utah my entire life and all of my family's here. I have friends here that I've known for forever, extended families here, right? So I have this community, but in reality, it comes down to the effort I put forth into those relationships. And some of my very, very best friends are the people that I met on Instagram that are overlanders that don't live anywhere near me The like I would consider them my best friends. And so it's, you know, from somebody who has that community, I really think it's just like you choose what effort that you put forth into it and then like it, it doesn't necessarily matter where you are or where they are how close you are to them it's just uh, we live in this amazing day and age where like we have incredible technology it's called marco polo i marco polo every day with my <laughs> yeah <laughs> love marco polo yeah, I'm, I'm so happy to, to hear you say that because i definitely have some like parent guilt a bit about lily not having a stable life and now she's got this one year in the school year in Utah and getting into a routine. But as I said, I'm already plotting and planning that I want to go and have another adventure before she gets too old to want to be with us, whatever age that might be, 13, 14, 15, I don't know. Um, and, so I, and so I kind of feel bad sometimes that, you know, I had this stable life. I lived in London for 18 years from birth till age 18. And, but like you, Misty, I mean, I'm in touch with a couple people from those years. So... But was it this great experience that I had stability? I, I guess so. But I think Lily feels just very strongly rooted to us, to me and to John, rather than to a physical place. But yeah, I, I, like, you know, today she's like out playing with the neighbor in the front yard. And that's where she came in before when you guys saw her. And I think these are really great experiences that I wanted to have. But 
is it okay if I wanted to have them just for a year or two and then we can go back on the road? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, I do think that it teaches them to be flexible. I think it teaches them that, you know, there's nothing wrong with staying put for a little while and then maybe moving and experiencing something new. You know, and I think that it makes them more adaptable to change because I'm sure it like Brittany, I know Caspian, you know, that kiddo can roll, roll with the punches and go with the flow. He is so easygoing. And I mean, I'm sure when he's tired, he's probably not, but you know, for the most part, you know, he's a pretty well-rounded kid and he's five years old and you know, he, he speaks very well. He's engaging. He, you know, I think. I think he's he's going to have a great childhood. I really do. I think we need to be really careful about who's making the rules that are impacting our entire lives because we're so used to the societal box that probably all five of us grew up inside to some extent. And so when we think about missing out, it's missing out on the only thing that we've ever known when there's an entire world out there that it doesn't mean that it's better, but it could be equally as good and maybe more beneficial to be flexible or to know how to make friends or to not be afraid when you walk into a room full of strange people that as an introvert, like that's something that's really hard for me. It's just hard mm -hmm. to go into a room of people that I've never met. And Caspian doesn't have that. It doesn't bother him. He's in a whole society where he doesn't even speak the language and he's the most social person ever. And instead of struggling and like going inside himself, he's just as extroverted as ever. And we're doing Duolingo every day and we've taken some in-person Spanish classes too, but right now we're back to Duolingo. And one of our words is un boleta, a ticket. And so today we were out at a park in Jalapa and he had little twigs and he would break them into pieces and walk up to strangers and say, un boleta, un boleta. And he must have walked up to 30 different people, handing them <laughs> little twigs so that they could have a ticket to go inside to the park. Yes. And um, that's profound to me as an introvert to have mm -hmm. that ability to go up to strangers who don't even speak your language, not to mention speak your language. The tricky thing so, is you don't know if like he would have done that anyway, because people keep asking me about that with Lily too. And I want to say, and I want to attribute it to the van, right? To the big trip, because I want that to be why. But you know, some kids are just like that anyway. So it's, it's hard for us to definitively say it's because of that, right? That's true. Yeah. I, I know some kids are going to be more outgoing than others for sure. But I do, I knew my kids before we started traveling and now, and, and it could be because of their ages as well, but I really do think that they're more outgoing than they were, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Like I just feel like they're not afraid to speak to different people, different people of different ages or different backgrounds or ethnicities. They just, they'll, they'll talk to everyone, you know, and that's one of the things I like about traveling around, even though we're only still traveling within the U.S., we're going all over the country and meeting people from all different areas and they have different backgrounds and different lifestyles. And that's one of the things, you know, I learned when I went into the military because I came from a small town. And like I said, same school, elementary, middle, high. But when I went into the military and I started getting stationed in different places and meeting different people, I had to learn mm -hmm. that, that, that adaptation, excuse me, as an adult. So, you know, I'm glad that they have that opportunity to learn that as a child. Mm -hmm. I think that's, Absolutely. yeah. And uh, that's the other thing is I still keep in touch with specific people, even though I was only stationed with them for a year or six months, two years, yeah. you know? Yeah. So yeah, it's that common bond, I think, that's more than mm -hmm. anything that you have with people and like overlanding mm -hmm. or the military yeah. or... Mm -hmm. Whenever adventure. you live through any kind of, exactly, yeah. When you live through any kind of adventure or experience or whatever, like the Bolivia story I was telling you earlier, my husband, John, always is texting with the guy, Marcos, that runs the Overland Route space where we were staying through that whole Bolivia revolution. They're always chatting on WhatsApp. Um, that I mean, we have so many people that we befriended and then we swapped WhatsApp, number, WhatsApp numbers and they still will just ping us every now and then randomly. And they always ask about Lily and they don't care about us, right? <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> did you start school? And... It's, it's really cool to just get the occasional random message. And I don't have to look back through the thread like, 
now was that the guy he, that's Columbia and that was before this or was that oh he's the guy that helped us with the battery and it's like piece together who the person was and how you knew them yeah hey Connie hey Connie hey Connie hey girl hey hey girl hey <laughs> thank you for joining us Connie and Joey very nice that you guys came and watched the show I love it so my next question is logistics of overlanding with the child. How do you guys handle that? Whether you do it part-time or full-time, what do you think, Laura? How hmm. do you handle logistics? Yeah, I was just trying to think. I was like, what, what is my answer to that question? <laughs> Let what me put you, you on the spot. What do you want specifically to know? Like, So how do you, would you plan differently if it were just you and your husband going? Would you pack differently? You know, just the whole thought process be behind traveling for the people that would like to know that are watching, you know, traveling with the child or traveling, you know, just adults. What yeah, do you think? absolutely. Well, absolutely. It's going to be majorly different. And I think the thing that sticks out most to me is the type of activities that we're planning or doing on our, our trips. Uh, because if it were just me and my husband, we would be like, you know, hardcore mountain biking or like, whitewater rafting, that kind of thing, which we did get to do in uh, Costa Rica. We took a, a kid-free overlanding trip in Costa Rica and we went whitewater rafting. We did all the things that you can't do with kids. So that's something that you have to keep in mind is that some of those things that you want to go do, you may not be able to do when, when you have kids. Um, but which what I have known- Not just true for overlanding, right? It's true for your daily life. Yes, absolutely. And, and what I found, though, is like sometimes I'll be bummed out like, oh, man, we can't go do this 12 mile hike because my kids can't hike that far and I can't carry them anymore. But um, I found that we have just as much fun on the one mile hike as we probably would have on the 12 mile hike, you know, and sometimes even more so because the kids like take it at a slower speed a slower speed than I would normally live life, you know? So they kind of forced me to slow down and smell the roses, as people would say. I think I got that phrase right this time. <laughs> <laughs> on the other side of the pond. Yes, on the other side of the <laughs> pond. <laughs> we still see that phrase on the other side of the pond. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Sure. So I think that's, that's kind of the biggest thing that pops out in my mind logistically. I mean, we could get like nitty gritty into like, things that you pack and how to pack and stuff like that. But um, maybe I'll let somebody else take that over. Mary, what did you do to plan logistically for traveling overseas with your daughter? Yeah, honestly, I don't feel like there was there's much difference. I, I think what Laura said is 100 percent true. And that's not really to do with overlanding or not. It's just having a child. I'm mm -hmm. totally the same as you. Suddenly, like we can't do the really long mountain bike ride. But we have to do a shorter thing. So that's definitely true, whether you're overlanding or you're living in your home and wherever you are. Um, but the only the main thing for us was homeschooling. So I did a bunch of research and she's dyslexic. And how are we going to teach her how to read? And how are we going to keep her up to date on all these different things? And um, but in terms of, yeah, like actually packing and what we do day to day, like, you know, there's a third passport. <laughs> in Japan. Um, I don't really I mean, maybe kind of like you were saying, Brittany, with, and your kid being so easygoing because they've traveled for so long, you know, she eats whatever the food is there like the, we don't have because like, i know some parents that don't travel that much on the rare times they do travel it's like they better bring all the special foods because the kid will only eat these things but i think when you're on the road for a long time there's no more like oh my child only will brush their teeth with this brand of toothpaste like no they're gonna just brush their teeth with whatever is in that country because that's all there is to buy <laughs> and get more kind of easy going and yeah they're, they're, i don't i can't think of anything specifically logistical besides homeschooling really. Brittany, what do you think? Yeah, we just made a decision that our life wasn't going to change just because we had a newborn baby on the road. I think the biggest thing was our nightlife. I mean, we stopped going out at night, basically, because our kid likes to sleep. But other than that, um, I mean, he learned what our family does. So we're a family that hikes. And so we set a goal that for every year of his life, he was going to hike a mile for that age. So even though he didn't walk until 15 months, he hiked a mile when he was one year old. And then he did two miles when he was two. And he hit five miles when he was four. 
And that's something that Eric and I actually didn't grow up hiking and neither of us are super like into extreme sports. And so Eric and I actually wouldn't hike that much if we hadn't set this goal for Caspian to do this. Mm -hmm. And so he keeps us going. And um, so it's just like, we're a family that blank. And whatever you want your family ethos to do, you just start as young as you can. And I think that's Mm -hmm. the benefit for us is how young we started. And so Caspian didn't have to give up a lot of toys that he used to have and doesn't have anymore. He didn't have to give up friends that he used to have or a school. Like he doesn't know anything other than this. And that's something that I treasure. But just because someone who's watching your experience may be different doesn't mean that you can't start small and build from there within your children's comfort zone and have an enriching experience from overlanding because there's so much to experience and so much to learn. You don't have to do some massive multi-year, multi-continent trip to benefit from this lifestyle. Yeah. But I think yeah, you're right. Absolutely. Sorry, go ahead, Laura. Well, I, w- I was just going to say like, exactly. Mm-hmm. Cause before we hopped on this call, we were talking about kind of our background and stuff. And I was telling about how my husband doesn't desire to travel full time. And so we're mm-hmm. kind of those weekend warriors. And I think that, you know, speaking to those who are in my situation, who are just like, oh man, like I wish I could travel full time, you know, just like trying to do everything that they could. Like those benefits are still there on those weekend warrior trips. Oh yeah. Like, don't worry guys. Like if you're, if you just have, you don't have a rooftop tent, you've got your ground tent, whatever it is. Like the point is, is that you're going out and you're doing it. So, and then I wanted to address this amazing <laughs> comment here. First of all, thank you for watching the videos. <laughs> that, just, like, that just makes me so happy. Um, okay. So why did we rent the FJs? I don't yeah. know if you're specifically talking about like, why did we choose to overland or why did we specifically choose to pick the FJs? Um, so we've actually been to Costa Rica twice. And the first time we took our kids and the second time we were just adults. And so here's another great example uh, for those who are weekend warriors, but want to have like overseas or uh, not overseas, but um, international experiences overlanding. Look for those places that you can rent overlanding equipment and you can see them they're popping up more and more as overlanding is becoming more and more popular but we went to costa rica and rented overlanding rigs with all of the equipment and everything (laughs) because fjs are the best they really were so fun to overland it so the first time we went um we we were in a troopy and <laughs> we thought it would be so cool because it was like a really old school troopy, you know, in the back seat, there were benches facing each other and we thought it would be the best, but really it was just a nightmare. Like it was an uncomfortable ride and our stuff was sliding everywhere and like all the stuff was in the back and it would just slowly creep forward so that the kids were just like buried in gear <laughs> in the back seat. <laughs> So hey, like, that happens oh, sometimes. We're not to be again. We're gonna it do that. Happen. So we did the FJs, and the FJs were so so awesome to to um, overland it. They really are so cool. I, I they handled great too. So thank you for watching. You're awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so the only other thing I think that I would like to know: Are there any essential must-have items? when you guys go overlanding with kids, are there any, is there anything that you're like, absolutely, we could not live without that. I don't know what we would do if we forgot that at home or anything like that. What do you think? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Brittany. I I mean, my answer is really short. I mean, mine is pretty much no. I, I find that I'm the one who hangs on to his stuff more than he does. (laughs) And we pack all these things and he's out playing with sticks and mud and whatever. I mean, yep. You don't really need anything. 
You don't. I mean, just start with what you have. That's what Eric and I always say. Start with what you have. Don't think that you have to fulfill this huge shopping list before your first overlanding trip. Go with what you have. Make three lists. What did you use? What did you not use? And what did you not bring that you wish that you had? Yeah. And if you make those three lists for your first few overlanding trips, you're really going to dial it in. And then you can start spending money with confidence that you actually need those things instead of just seeing it on Instagram and thinking, well, they have that. So I need to have it too. Um, right. Because that yeah. will get you in trouble really fast. Yeah, and it's a very expensive yes. hobby. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It I can be. Say- to answer that question, I would say, and this is totally coming from <laughs> my soapbox of like being responsible travelers, I would say anything that more <laughs> enables you to be a responsible traveler. So whether you don't like picking up other people's trash, because let's face it, we're, we don't just pick up our own trash, we pick up other people's trash too. So oh, yeah. if you bring a pair of leather gloves to do that, or you need to bring bring like a grabby stick, like make sure that those are included. And I think those things are often overlooked. So like by, we just got some Kula cloths, which are like pee rags instead of using uh, toilet paper to help us to Mm -hmm. cut down on our impact that we have, that we leave behind and make sure that you bring enough garbage sacks or that you have a way to collect your ashes from the fire pit, stuff like that. Those are things that I definitely don't think we think about, but need to be brought and getting your kids involved in that from just a young age. Like we've just started to give them the tasks each before we leave. It's like, okay, I need everybody to go pick up all the garbage that you find. Getting them all involved in that is from a young age is so important to, to create powerful stewards so that we can like have a place to, continue to explore and all of our lands aren't going to get shut down and things like that. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to now step off the soapbox. (laughs) (laughs) I would just be happy if people stopped using the fire rings and the fire pits as trash cans. Right. I can't tell you how many times I've seen that. Yeah. That just drives me crazy. So yes, we bring plastic bags and gloves and we've picked up many a a site. So absolutely. Yeah. What you're saying. That's right. <laughs> One thing that was kind of a, a surprising, a surprisingly large reduction in our trash was we mm-hmm. I don't remember where we were, maybe southern Mexico. But when we were getting into like kind of more tropical areas, I mean, we realized what percent of our trash was basically compostable, organic, right? And so we yeah. went to some hardware store, Ferreteria, and we just bought a little bucket. And I mean, space is such a premium in our little van, but we're like, okay, we're going to stick this little bucket next to the trash can, and we put all the compost in there. And we filled that thing up three times a day. And we started emptying. We have a tiny trash can, just basically like a very small shopping bag sized trash can. And we started not having to empty that. For maybe once a week, we had to get rid of that thing. So it made a huge difference. That. That's great. Yeah. You have to find somewhere to take it, especially if you're doing it full time. You know, that if you have a bunch of trash, what are you going to do with all of it, right? So yeah, and it makes sense have- in, in that sense to, to narrow it down as well. Yeah. yeah so like our yeah. organic trash, people always say, well, then why did you dump the organic trash? I'm like, we we're driving through the jungle. <laughs> Just dump it out the window. It's like it's like things are growing from around your tire. But to your original question about anything indispensable, maybe because I'm sl- slightly older, I'm really curious to see Brittany uh, as Caspian's getting more into schooling age. But I would say like if I had to, if there was one thing that I could bring up for Lily that I um and everything else could get left behind, it'd be the Kindle because that was just this window of opportunity for reading books at any age level in any language and any topic. So like, she's really into dragons. Okay, I'm searching for the dragon books. Okay, she's really struggling to read and she's really embarrassed to even try because she's so bad at it. I'm studying to, like online, finding books that are designed for that age or for people struggling to read. And then when she had this sort of breakthrough and she learns to read, it was a life changer as we were driving along because she'd be reading these books and reading aloud to us. We were reading in bed at night. It's, it's one thing that's tricky when you're on the road is getting books in oh. English at the right level of the right topic, not just for her, but for me as well because I really love reading. So. We have, we have two Kindles and I mean, we went through hundreds of books literally. And so you can sometimes find books in exchange with locals, but it's really hard, especially when your kid's going through, you know, like 10 books a week because they're at that age, the books are tiny. So you need so many of them. Yeah. That'd be the one thing I would yeah. say, like, absolutely. I cannot live without 
<laughs> the Kindle Fire is awesome, and you can get online through a major public library. So yes, right now, the exactly. Seattle Public Library only requires a phone number. And so we get books through the library, which are better quality than the ones through Amazon Kids. And we send them straight to his Kindle Fire. And we set a goal of him reading a thousand books before he turned five. So he just did that this past year. And that was because of the Kindle fire that we were able to do that on the road. So that is awesome. And actually yesterday he got into Audible. So he was listening to like Aladdin and Peter Pan and he loves those too. Yeah. And that's That's a great tip because we were spending so much money the first, I guess, year um, buying all these books for her because she was going through like the Magic Treehouse series and it's five bucks oh, a yeah. book. She reads a book in two days because they're so short. And then I can't remember where I, on some overlanding or families traveling group, I got that tip about the library. So, and luckily we hadn't left our hometown of Mountain View, California for very long at that point. Maybe we'd been on the road a year or something. And so my card still worked and I got in and it was amazing. Like such a huge selection of books that you can just get sent directly to your Kindle. I, I still use mm-hmm. it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's awesome. My, my youngest is a big time reader and she actually prefers the paperback books. You know, she likes holding the books and reading them. So mm-hmm. I do let her bring a few with her. And then again, we donate those and when we get new ones, but yeah, having that electronic device for them to be able to read on is amazing as well. I think as soon as you cross the border out of the country, it's, it's, it's basically indispensable because you, you just can't yeah. buy those English language books. And that's, of course, if you want them to read any Spanish books, then it's great. Mm-hmm. Okay, we have a question here. I love the Gladiator. Still happy with your setup? Or do you have any big changes planned for when you get back to the U.S., Brittany? We're super thrilled with the Gladiator and so thankful that we started with what we had, which was the Wrangler. And we traveled in it for almost three years and lived out of it for all the first two trips to Mexico. So we don't have any big changes planned. I can't wait to crawl into bed in a little while. It feels like home and we really love it. I'm not just saying that. Do you, is there something that you liked better about the Wrangler than the Gladiator or vice versa or? I don't think so. I mean, we loved that the Wrangler was a Rubicon and had a little bit more off-road capability and we had built it for off-roading. But at the same time, because it was built for off-roading and then we added all the overlanding stuff onto it, it was so over payload capacity and we were never comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And so with the Gladiator, before we even purchased the Gladiator, not to mention the modifications, we had a spreadsheet in Google Drive where we kept track of our payload and we're adding all our modifications and the kit that we wanted to put inside to try and stay underweight and i'm really glad we were able to start from scratch like that absolutely and that your husband told joe and i about that spreadsheet and that's what we did when we started building out our jeep because they can't carry hardly anything yeah so my land cruiser is my little pack mule you know she can she can carry a lot yeah but you know the jeeps just they can go anywhere and can't carry anything Mm -hmm. so (laughs) But Brittany, you're, you're so right about the, like, it's your home and it's your bed and it's your comfortable place you want to be. Because so many times we'd get invited by somebody to, to stay and we would, yes. <laughs> right? Because they want to invite you in and you've got a spare bed or whatever. And you don't want to be rude, but you're like, no, you don't understand. Like, this is my house. Yeah. Like, I, I have everything. Like, I'll take a hot shower. I'll do a load exactly. of laundry, but I'm sleeping in my bed tonight. <laughs> exactly. And then since I've been yeah. back in stable, I've had some overlanders coming through and staying. And I completely understand. I'm like, you know, I've got a spare bedroom, but cool. Yep. Sleep in the driveway. No worries. Because I get yeah. it. It's their home. They they, they want to reach out for their Kindle or for their clean underwear or for their water. But like they know where everything is and it's always in the same place. And so yeah. people that haven't lived in a van don't understand. They think that you're like, you know, this this homeless hobo and, and poor <laughs> you and you should get a spare bedroom instead. Like, no, thanks. thanks I'm good. <laughs> no. But it, listen, we're in two rooftop tents and we wouldn't have it any other way. It's home. So mm-hmm. you don't need a big, we've had a motor home. We've had, you know, the super C and we've had the houses and all that stuff. And, you know, home is where you make it and where you park it. And you don't necessarily need to be bigger and better just to go where you want to go and do what you want to do. Right. That's right. That's what so, they say. That's what they say. That's what I say. <laughs> that's what <you> say right? <laughs> 
So let's see here. Joey says, US, someone said, what's that? Uh, someone asked a question. So you're going back to the US. I thought you were going south from Mexico and South America. Are you talking to me? Yeah. Yes, we are very much going around the world. Uh, but sometime next year, we'll probably fly back to the United States to see family and oh, maybe okay. do some public speaking. And then we'll go back to our gladiator after a few weeks and continue on from there. Cool. I thought the question was someone said, are you get something about changing your vehicle when you go back to the US or something? But Oh, oh yeah. I go. don't know yeah. that our gladiator is going to last 15 years around the world so we'll see well, it's a big experiment well you That's still have the wrangler as well so <laughs> we do yeah we have the wrangler in denver but mm. yeah once we get to africa <laughs> yeah once we get to africa europe australia there's so many overlanding vehicles yeah it'll be fun to see eric says all you need to overland around the world is to have the five essentials of survival covered if you have water, food, shelter, warmth, and sleep covered, you can go anywhere. That's true. That's true. Absolutely. And your Kindle. And, and your the Kindle. Kindle. <laughs> water bottle and clean underwear. Yeah. yeah. Clean underwear. Yes. You get, must have clean underwear at times. <laughs> well, I really appreciate having you guys on tonight and, and coming you guys coming on the show. And I know Arla that you did great tonight. I love having you as a co-host. I had a really good time. You're amazing. <laughs> and thank you guys for watching. Um, be sure to tune in next week. Next Tuesday, we'll do another show and we'll announce who's going to be on that show probably in the next day or so. So keep an eye out for that. Yep. And safe travels to all of you. And thanks again for watching. Thanks, Have a good ladies. night. Thank you. Bye, thank you. It was so awesome. <laughs>